when uh, we met last time in my previous session, I ended the session with a bit of a problem. And I'd like to repeat it again. If I were to come up to you and were to say something like this, I want to tell you something about a young lady named Mary. Well, Mary was a sensible and giddy young lady, wise and silly beyond compare. She was a slight and small creature, yet so large that everybody who knew her loved her. She felt rather lonely because she lived in a town with no other houses or people for miles around. What would be your reaction? What would be the momentary, automatic response you would be likely to give? We've asked several thousand people this very same question with this kind of example. This is a very simple one. And one can catalog and classify the kinds of responses. Now, I haven't time to describe all of the varieties, but they range between those people who dismiss the speaker. They say, oh, he's all mixed up. He's contradictory. He's talking nonsense. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know the meanings of words. He's, uh, he's all mixed up. Uh, and sometimes they're a little bit less complimentary than that. And then they range all the way down to another category, uh, at the very far end, when people have, as it were, a mood of inquiry. They don't dismiss, but they say, well, now, whatever you, are you trying to say? What are you after? What are you trying to get across to me? What, uh, say it in other words so that I don't misunderstand you. Now, between these two poles of dismissal and inquiry, there are a, a number of other possibilities, but they are by no means important, because these are the two I should like to focus on. And I might just say at the moment, if you dismiss me, if I come up to you in a hurried situation and say Mary was a sensible and giddy young lady, and you tell me that I mixed up contradictory, my normal reaction is not necessarily to think that you're being friendly or you're being too wise yourself. So that there are some very interesting human dynamic interrelationships that come whenever someone dismisses someone else. And I should like to talk about this phenomenon of dismissal as it relates to the larger problem of understanding and misunderstanding in my remaining session today. Now, I should like to approach an attempt to deal with this kind of difficulty, but perhaps by beginning technically. I'd like to ask you to think with me a little bit about what we know about words. What are some of the most obvious, well-organized, well-agreed-upon characteristics of, of a language, whether it's English or any other? Well, I can run them down into a series of numbers. Let me begin. In the first place, we can make a distinction between technical terms and non-technical terms. Now, by the technical terms, I mean all those words used in any specialized area in chemistry, physics, TV, the law, and elsewhere, where the range of use of a word will be very narrow. Thus, for example, if I ask for sodium biosulfite, if there's such a thing, in a drugstore in New York City or in San Diego, I'm very likely to get the very same thing. That is, sodium biosulfite is a word with very narrow, limited uses. It's a technical term. We've uh, stipulated, we've decided that the word will have that usage and not very many others. And in the law, there are hundreds of such terms. And in engineering and electricity and, and physics and so on and so on. But it isn't those words I'm interested in. I'm interested in the hundreds of thousands of others which are the non-technical terms. Now, the non-technical terms are all those that I will be using most of the time uh, in this talk today. They are the words like run and talk and how and feel. That is all of the words which we will be using 95%, or it's almost 99% of our talking time. Now, the peculiar and interesting thing about these words is, take, for example, the word run. Well, it will have many uses. I can talk about uh, running a race or running a mile or home run or sheep run or uh, something having to do with a little boy's nose or colors running or run on a bank or run in a stocking. And each one of these uses is quite different. And the range, we will say, of the uses of the word run will be very broad, whereas the range of a technical term like electron might be very much narrower. Well, that's the first thing we know, that many, many words, uh, take the word strike, for example. Uh, it's used in baseball to miss, in fishing to hit, in labor activities to go away from, in boxing uh, to hit, and so on and so on. Uh, the word fast, uh, sometimes in the sense of going in a great rush. Sometimes when we talk about a fast color, we mean staying put in one place. So uh, my first characteristic, <coughs> that is the first point, uh, words may be used in a narrow or wide range depending. Second thing we know, 
we know that there are tremendous regional variations in the uses of words. That uh, a word will be used in one part of the country in one way and in another part of the country in another way. I was in a meeting in San Francisco some time back, and in the middle of the morning, our chairman looked up and said, well, I think we've gone far enough. Why don't we interrupt this and go out and have uh, some coffee and snails? And my first impulse was to say, isn't it a little early for that sort of thing? Well, snails in San Francisco, uh, when you ask for them, you get something quite different from what you will get, say, if you ask for them in Chicago. A snail in San Francisco is a wound-up sweet roll that uh, looks very much uh, like a snail. I was in Montgomery, Alabama some time ago and uh, talked to a friend of mine who turned to me and said, when the meeting is over, I'll carry you to town. And my first impulse was uh, to say, thank you very much, but can't I go on my own theme? But carry you to town, uh, for him, merely meant the, uh, the fact that he was offering me a ride in his car. And thus, there are regional variations uh, that occur, and, and perhaps you can think of some in, in usage. Of course, some of the greatest differences occur between usage in this country and in England. Uh, if you travel to uh, Great Britain, for example, you readily discover the tremendous variation. In England, for example, a dessert is a sweet. The waitress will ask you, will you have a, what kind of sweet will you have? A cop is very rarely is. Uh, uh, he's a bobby. Garters are suspenders. If you ask for suspenders, you will not get what you're likely to get in a store in this country. Suspenders there are braces. Uh, bloody, I might say, is a curse word in England and is very rarely used in polite company. Taffy is toffee. Syrup is treacle. You have cakes with treacle. Soft drinks are minerals. Think of the range of words we have to talk about soft drinks in this country. A rumble seat is a dicky. The second floor is the first floor. When someone lives on the first floor, you, you have to climb up. A roller coaster is a switchback railway, and so on and so on. That is, one of the very readily recognized things is that words in different parts of the country, and even in different jobs, a man in, in the, the printing business, or in the carpentry business, or the TV business, will begin to develop a bunch of words that he will use in his own way. Uh, a dolly in the TV jargon is not exactly what it will be to a little girl going into the 10 cent store. That is, there's a range of uses, and we're accustomed to that. And of course, a third thing that we know about words, and that is that words change historically. A word that when, when Chaucer, for example, talked of having in one of the tales of someone having been to a solemn party, he did not mean the kind of party that uh, we would think he meant. A solemn party for him was one that ended in a drunken brawl. It was a party which became solemn. For us, the usage is quite different. Uh, think, for example, of, of the changes in, in possible uses. Just a few centuries ago, when Middle English was spoken, King James once referred to St. Paul's Cathedral as amusing, awful, and artificial. Now, if someone were to call a creation of yours amusing, awful, and artificial, or of mine, I should be disposed uh, not to think too highly of it. But then, that statement was a rare compliment. Uh, King James meant that for amusing, he meant amazing. Awful, he used in the sense of awe-inspiring, and artificial, by the word artificial, he meant artistic. And thus he was paying a rare compliment in words which, if used by one of us probably today, would be a, a rather a derogatory kind of insult. Think uh, also of the history of the changes of the uses of words. The word cowboy. The Dictionary of American English gives countless numbers of these fascinating stories, but the word cowboy is of some interest. This was not originally a Western word at all. Before the days of dude ranches, <clears throat> uh, this word was used in an utterly different sense. Indeed, it was an Eastern word used to describe George III's fifth column in the American colonies. The cowboys of the last quarter of the 18th century <clears throat> were Tory sympathizers who wandered through the woods at night ringing cowbells. Unsuspecting American patriots hearing the tinkle would sally forth with lanterns in search of the straying bossies and bessies supposedly attached to the bells and were promptly blitzkrieged by enemy blunderbusses. Now, if the cowboy was a, a Tory fifth columnist, a, a quizzling, a, a person who sold out. And then one can find some other characteristics of the language. Another one of the characteristics that we're thoroughly aware of is the continuous coinage of new words. That is, in, in our society, English is growing at a tremendous pace. 
And uh, the history of the development and creation of new words is an extre extremely interesting study of which I can merely touch on at the moment. John Milton, for example, was a famous coiner of words. Uh, by the way, the technical word for a word which is coined is a neologism. And most students of language will think of the word neologism in fairly much the same way. But here are some of the words that, that Milton coined. Dimensionless, infinitude, emblazonry, bannered, anarch, satanic, echoing, irradiant, pandemonium. Mark Twain in uh, this country was a prolific coiner of words. A word, uh, those of you interested in poker uh, may recognize, may or may not recognize, that Mark Twain coined m many, many of the phrases that will be used. Words like passing the buck, four flushing, sitting pretty, and new deal. That word new deal was not one that was coined in the 30s. Indeed, General Sherman back in 1863 once said, Charleston has not taken, the war is prolonged, and but little chance of its ending until we have a new deal. That's another one of the characteristics. And incidentally, our, our dictionaries are hard put to keep up. Think of these words which are only in the most recently published uh, American College Dictionary. Superbomb, beanie, canasta, quickie, do-gooder, MC, formica, gin rummy, gobbledygook, hassle, Israeli, king size, orlan, motel, polster, and so on. Words which uh, we continuously make up, and that's something I think we'll not think about. And finally, the last of the characteristics of English that I should like to talk about, of course the list is very much longer, is the fact that in English we know how to make differences in tone in our expression. Now by tone I don't mean melody, I mean the status of our talk. For example, I have a friend whose daughter was being married recently and he knew me well enough. He could have called me up to say, hey Lee, why don't you come uh, Saturday to see my kid get hitched? But no, he didn't do that. He sent me a very handsomely engraved statement on vellum in which he said, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so request the pleasure of your attendance at the nuptials of their daughter, Susan Ann. Now, the difference between these two is one of tone. It isn't one of meaning. The intention may be exactly the same in both cases, but there's a difference in tone. One is not likely in certain circumstances to use certain kinds of words. Uh, thus, for example, I might mean exactly the same thing if I asked you to put out the lights or douse the glim or terminate the illumination. That is, I, these phrases are interchangeable, but I'm not likely to use uh, douse the glim in a studio or in uh, Washington during the war if I wanted somebody to be sure that the lights were turned out. Or I might say, for example, I beat it to the door, I hastily quitted the room, I retired precipitately. I, I would probably do exactly the same thing. But these ways, these statements or phrases are ways of talking about what I did with more or less uh, differences in tone or status. Now then, what does this all mean? What does it mean to say that we continually create words, that words change historically, that words mean different things at different periods? I think it means only that if we are aware of some of the things we know about language, our attitude towards it might be somewhat more flexible, somewhat less inclined to believe that words are fixed and remain fixed all the time, that words change. They're used differently in different places. Now, this is very old stuff, but we tend somehow to forget it. We tend to forget in the hurry of our talking that words are used in all sorts of ways quite differently. Now, you remember what I said about uh, Mary, if I may go back for the moment. I said Mary was a sensible and giddy young lady. Now, that looks like a contradiction, but if I might explain the kind of ornery stunt that I did, I might say that the word giddy I was using in a very older sense. If you notice it or spell it out in your mind, you'll notice that it looks very much like godly. And it can't come, by the way, from the same stem, stem as God and used to mean divinely possessed, enthusiastic, and no sense of dizziness or foolishness. And may I say, suppose I was using it in that sense, and I merely meant Mary was a sensible and enthusiastic young lady, wise and silly beyond compare. Now, the word silly comes from that German, the word selig means blessed or happy, and of course, as the word language developed, the word came to be used in a satirical sense, according to that wise old philosopher Solon, no man had a right to call himself happy until he was dead. So that accordingly, he who regarded himself as blessed was a fool. In other words, I was using that, and she was a wise and happy, she was a slight and small creature. Now, would you play the game? She was a slight and small creature, yet so large. 
Might I mean something besides big? Yes, because the word large just for a very long time in the history of youth was used in the sense of generous. We even talk about a person with a large heart. 